a bit about the developing nervous system, the role of rupture and repair in relationship. It is really about how we learn to trust or mistrust ourselves and the world. The role of relational rupture and repair, it's truly the back and forth interaction between people. So rupture is a break in connection and repair is the reconnection after that break. This process is a natural and healthy relational concept. It becomes a problem when it is chronic, when the rupture is chronic, and most importantly, when the repair does not happen or only happens periodically. Some definitions around this. So I'm gonna begin with what these concepts mean from a healthy standpoint. In the modules that are geared more towards trauma, these topics will be discussed from that realm of dysfunction. Bonding, most of us know, is the connection or seeking of proximity for safety. An important concept is that bonding is innate. Connection is innate. We are hardwired as are all mammals to seek proximity for safety. The length of time that this lasts varies by species and humans require the longest amount of time in connection with others to develop feelings of internal and external safety. Attunement is response to and from the environment. And when I say environment, I mean primary caregivers and the people that are around them. Uh, beginning of the self-awareness and it's really when our caregivers are attuned to our needs, we learn to trust them and ourselves, knowing who we are and what we want. This is truly the beginning of the development of autonomy. Attachment is engagement with others for safety and survival. It's related to bonding and attunement. And remember, none of these are separate phases. They are fluid and they take time to fully evolve. When I talk about environment, this again consists of primary caregivers. This is who cares for us as infants and um, the most and often first. So when we talk about other in psychological terms, it means the outside source of feedback. This is who else is in our immediate environment consistently. It's parents, siblings, grandparents, other caregivers, and a couple of these videos here give some important information about all of these concepts. Uh, I encourage you to either watch them now um, or uh, at, uh, immediately after this PowerPoint. I'm gonna begin a bit with uh, some uh, concepts, psychological concepts. I'm just going to touch on these. Um, and I'm gonna start with attachment theory, which was first developed by John Bowlby. He was one of the first to study the consequences of diminished connection between parent and child. So just to give you a little bit of history about Dr. Bowlby, he was the son of a man who was the doctor to the King of England. Before he developed his theory, um, he it was really truly thought in medicine that children attached to parents purely out of a necessity for food. But Bowlby began to be curious about the behaviors of children who had been sent to live in the countryside for safety reasons during some of the bombings that were happening in London during World War II. The, uh, what he started to recognize is that the behavior actually comes from a psychological and evolutionary perspective. And the primary concern is relationship, social and emotional development. Another key player in the attachment theory is Mary Ainsworth. She studied with John Bowlby and she added um, a great deal to his attachment theory. So there's a, qu a quick little video here uh, called The Strange Situation, if you're not familiar with this, that describes a scenario that's set up to determine a child's attachment attachment style. Ainsworth also studied with children in their homes in the United States um, and to get a more realistic idea of behaviors and relationship styles and she also studied parenting in Uganda. Another key figure is Mary Klein. She developed play therapy. She was one of the first to use play therapy to understand the development of behavioral issues in children and her work was truly groundbreaking. Now, Donald Winnicott also studied development in relational behavior. He acknowledged that 
The social processes we engage in help to shape neural structures during development. You may read things or hear about things that where they refer to the good enough mother or a holding environment or transitional object. These are concepts that formed the basis for a great deal of what we know about and how we conceptualize relational therapies. It's born out of psychoanalytic therapies that were originally developed by Freud and some of, uh, some of his contemporaries. So just a real quick overview of something that's called object relations. So Margaret Mahler studied children extensively through observation in real life situations. Her understanding of the developmental stages of separation and individuation gave rise to greater understanding of healthy attachment in children and into adulthood. So talking about early childhood, that there is no separation and distinction between parent and self, that we literally as children, we do not have the brain power, the brain structures, um, the concepts, psychological concepts to be able to see ourselves um, as separate from our primary caregivers. That's something that happens over time. So Mahler um, came up with this, uh, it's called rapprochement, which is that moving away and coming back um, as to determine levels of safety between child and primary caregiver. Separation helps us to develop limits and individuation helps us to create a, a better sense of self. Now, James Masterson gave us the understanding of borderline personality disorder, which will be discussed in another module. And a, a kind of an important concept here is RORU and WORU. So RORU stands for Rewarding Object Relational Unit. And this is a concept that our behavior gets rewarded when our behavior suits our primary caregivers. WORU stands for with, withdrawing object relational unit. And this is about the attention or love or sense of safety that it gets removed when our behavior does not suit our primary caregivers. One of the things that's important, a concept that's important for us to take into consideration and to really hold on to is that we will make adaptations in order to stay connected. This is going to be a really important concept when we start talking a little bit more about psychological issues, trauma in particular. So a little bit more about object relations. So object is defined as people in the world. It can be anyone, but it generally begins with our primary caregivers. An internal object is our internal representation or mental image of other. External object is an existing person, internal representation connected to self and other. And object constancy is a term that means that we can hold an object uh, the image of another or an object in our mind, even if they are not present. It also means that we know others hold an image in their minds of us when we are not in direct contact with the other. It is related to something that's called theory of mind, which I'll be talking about in the next, uh, in one of the next PowerPoints. So interaction with early caregivers is significant. It creates healthy interaction or unhealthy interaction, but ideally those healthy interactions help us to create an in, a healthy sense of, of ourselves. Um, again, it helps kind of with that internalization of self and other. So internalized attitudes about ourself and other helps us to develop a healthy sense of self-perception. And it really helps us um, to define and develop um, how we approach relationships. All right, mirror neurons. So there's some controversy around this topic, but I'm gonna leave it up to you to decide. So I want you to watch these two videos either now or um, immediately after you are done with the this PowerPoint. And a couple of um, people important in, um, in the understanding of mirror neurons, Dan Siegel is one of them. Um, and the two videos may help you or not to decide the fate of this concept. I want to throw in a bit about polyvagal theory here. So this is again another controversial topic. There has been quite a bit of debate in the validity of many of Dr. Porges' ideas and statements. 
I'm going to leave this here again for you to decide, knowing that the polyvagal theory has given many people in the mental health field some um, ways to kind of hold and conceptualize why people behave in ways that they behave and even have accompanying physical and mental health issues. So Dr. Porges worked uh, for around 40 years with infants and that had um, heart rate variability issues. Those were kind of some of his early um, research. Now, the idea behind polyvagal theory is that the vagus nerve has two branches. There is the ventral branch, which is the nucleus um, and the front part of the nerve, and it regulates supradiaphragmatic organs, so everything from the diaphragm up. They have motor fibers that originate in the nucleus ambiguous, which are myelinated, and remember those are the ones that are covered in fat. They're phylogenetically newer, um, and they're quicker. The dorsal uh, has the nucleus in the back of the nerve, if you will. So this helps to regulate subdiaphragmatic organs, so everything from the diaphragm down. The motor fibers originating in the dorsal nucleus and nucleus of the tract solitarius or solitarius tractus. Um, these are unmyelinated. Phylogenetically, they're a little bit older and they tend to be a little bit slower. An important concept here is that of social engagement. So I want you to think back to the PowerPoint with the five self-protective responses. And social engagement is part of that orienting response. We attempt to socially engage the real or imagined threat with eye contact and vocalizations as a way to determine or to manage safety. This is a really important concept that will be revisited in the trauma module. All right, so these are kind of a couple busy pictures straight out of Netter. Um, it's the uh, areas of the brain where the nucleus of the 10 cranial nerves reside. So again, you may wanna pause this and take a little bit of a look at it, but you can see um, some of these structures that we talked about earlier, the pons, um, there's the cerebellum, um, talking about these areas um, where these cranial nerves, many of them originate. And just uh, a reminder of some of the important neurotransmitters that are discussed in the CNS and PNS PowerPoints. Um, these are how these chemicals are important in a relational context. So we can see that um, if you take this in perspective of what might be happening with a person on a mental psychological level and what chemicals, what neurotransmitters may be being released and being overactivated within a person's system. And again, remembering that we don't have conscious control over the release of these chemicals. And um, so they happen automatically we don't, again, we are not able to regulate those. Um, this is where some of the, you know, mind-body techniques come in, not neurofeedback, biofeedback, meditation, progressive relaxation, those types of things ideally can help um, to calm and to settle the nervous system so that we're not stuck in that sympathetic fight or flight response, but we're also not stuck in an over-exaggerated parasympathetic shutdown. In summary, human beings are hardwired to connect and we will alter our behavior in order to make that happen. The consequences of healthy or unhealthy connection early in life has long lasting effects on both our physical and mental health. And of course, here are your references.